so I'm going to start off with a few administrative items. Uh, Milestone 1 has been released. You're going to complete it in a team and submit it by before the end of the day on Friday, February 11th. It's worth 10% of your final mark, and there are two components. 7% of it is automatically graded for both functionality, so some of the tests just check that you get the right answer, and runtime, so some of the tests check that you're fast enough. There are um, many public tests that you run with EC297 exercise, so you get a report card of how you're doing. We don't expect uh, most people to pass all the tests, so some of the tests are harder than others. It's okay, it's not a lab. You don't have to pass all of them. We give part marks. Uh, obviously, if you pass them all, that's great. The other 3% of, and there are private tests too, okay? So there are public tests, and then there are private tests will run your submission that will also be incorporated in your grade. The private tests aren't any harder than the public tests. Uh, they just make sure that you haven't hard-coded things. The other 3% of the mark comes from your TA uh, on basically how you did things. Uh, how did you manage the project? Uh, how clear was your wiki documenting your status and your plans? What's your coding style like? Did you use Git well? Did you write good uh, messages? Do, do all the team members understand the code, etc.? So there are instructions in that link, and there's a rubric for the part of the mark that comes from the TA. So go look at that, and it'll tell you what the TA is looking for. Um, if you're in a team already, that's great. If not, you will meet. Well, if you're in a team, you're going to meet with your CI in the first hour of your tutorial this week and go on Quirkus to find the Zoom link for your CI. In the second hour of the tutorial, you can join the usual link for a Milestone 1 walkthrough. So it's additional information about how to get started on Milestone 1. We're basically, as a group, going to code one of the Milestone functions, one functions that you have to do. So if you don't get that function right, it means you're not paying attention to the tutorial because we basically give you the answer to show it to you. Uh, so I'm sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, sure. If you can make me co-host, I can uh, do a backup recording, but I can't okay. do it if I'm not co-host. Okay, sounds good. I'll try doing that right now. And let's see. Oops, have to do it on the other machine. Okay, so Ken, you should be a co-host now. You should be able to record. Um, okay, I see a few questions going back to milestone one about uh, speed tests. So one it's a good one. Are If you're in a clear for speed on the test cases, are you safe for the private tests? Yeah, private tests are no harder than the public tests. So if you pass the, the public speed test with more than you know an epsilon, like a microsecond of, uh, of margin, then you're going to be fine on the private ones because they're not any harder. They're just different. Uh, are you going to be given the time complexity to aim for? I'll talk about that in the tutorial. Um, basically, the, the header file describes how fast things need to be. And uh, in the tutorial, uh, I talk about basically what does that mean. Some of the functions don't have to be very fast. Other ones, it says they have high speed requirements. If they have a high speed requirement, we expect you to get the best computational complexity that you can. Uh, let's see. So we don't tell you, oh, you need to have this exact computational complexity, but if we say the speed requirement is high, then, yeah, once again, we expect you to get the best computational complexity you could by choosing appropriate data structures. Uh, okay, let's say, uh, and there's a question, can we use the code from the tutorial? Yeah, code that we give you in the tutorial is we are in, we're trying to be like, you know, hands-on. So this is something you're doing. We're going to work through it together. And we expect you to take that code and put it in the project. Unless you say, I don't like your style, I'm going to rewrite it. It's totally fine too. Okay, say you're not in a team. Dr. Tallman will meet with you in your tutorial time slot to, to group all the un, unteamed students. Uh, so that's his Zoom link. Wednesday, it'll be the first hour of the tutorial. Thursday, first hour of the tutorial. Friday, the second hour of the tutorial. So those are the times at which you would meet Dr. Tallman in order to be put in a team if you don't have one yet. I just mentioned that your TA is going to be looking at how you manage the project, how you report status as, as one of the components of your grade on Milestone uh, 1. And your CI is also going to be looking at this as part of an overall mark you get late in the course for participation and professionalism and, and organization. So you want to make your, your wiki and your project management good. 
We're going to go through, the syllabus has a few tips on how to do this. Uh, we're going to go through it in a future lecture as well. What, what are we looking for in terms of status reporting and project planning? For now, you just want to check that you can get onto your wiki and start making some plans. Your login info has been mailed to you. Uh, some students have said it gone, went to their junk email, so go check that. And if you really can't find the login information, uh, post on Piazza and I'll send it to you again. Um, and I already mentioned this, so basically the wiki is for planning, tracking status, anything else you want. You can put anything you want on there, but the part your CI and TA really want to see is your planning and your tracking. And we'll talk about that in the future. Okay. Um, and I see a question about is, yeah, maybe I'll answer some of these questions uh, at, at the end of the lecture. So if I don't answer your question in the chat, um, stay on the line and we'll ask, answer it at the end of the lecture. Okay, so I'm going to talk now a bit about OpenStreetMap and graphs. So the data that you're going to use for actually milestone one and all future milestones and, and a key data structure called a graph that is a logical way to organize this data. Okay, so OpenStreetMap is a, an organization that creates an open geographic database of the world. So it's created by regular people contributing data and it's used in all sorts of products. So there's a lot of geographic information systems that are built on top of this data because it's quite, quite thorough. There's a lot of it. Now I'm gonna quickly describe to you how the OSM data is organized. So you, and, and if you wish later in the project, you can work directly with this open street map data to make your map look better, to get additional information. But mostly for milestone one, uh, I'm going to show you how to work with some higher level, more organized data that we're going to give you. But I'm going to start off by just describing what is the low level OSM data that is actually coming from that database. So OpenStreetMap defines three kinds of entities. And uh, each one of those, so entities are just things, three things that together can represent the world. Every one of those entities is identified by a globally unique 64-bit integer ID called an OSM ID. Okay, so 64-bit integer is big. You can store an extremely large number in that. So they take every point that is interesting, every outline, every road, and they give them all unique integer IDs So for the whole world so that everything, your house, would have its own unique ID that no one else in the world would have. And that is called an OSM ID, really big integer. The three entities that they have, now every one of them has its own ID, are OSM nodes. An OSM node is just a point. So it's a point on the earth. It has a latitude and a longitude. OSM ways group those points together to form um, paths. So given a way would say there are a whole bunch of points each of which has a latitude and a longitude, so these OSM nodes, and together they form some path, which is maybe a piece of a road, maybe a piece of shoreline, maybe part of a park boundary, etc. So they're outlines. And then the last thing OSM has, the last kind of entity, is called an OSM relation. And an OSM relation is just a grouping of other entities. So for example, subway lines in Toronto are defined as groupings of ways. So there'd be a certain way that goes between two subway stations and a way itself is a path. And there'd be several of those together in an OSM relation that would define maybe the young subway line, for example. You can also have optional tags on these points and ways and tags at OSM are just key value pairs. So for example, we could have a key of name and a value of young and that might be tagged on the young subway line. We could have a key of natural and a tag of water to say uh, this is an outline of part of Lake Ontario. Okay, so extensive documentation on this, on uh, this OpenStreetMap wiki. So lots of open source projects and, and other things like Wikipedia use wiki as the way that they organize um, their web pages. So you can go and look at OpenStreetMap. Okay, this is a pretty brief overview of, of OpenStreetMap. Um, don't worry if you go, I don't exactly understand how all this fits together. The truth is you don't have to use most of these open street map concepts in this project if you don't want to, because we, we've taken them to a somewhat higher level for you. And that's what I'm mostly going to talk about in this, in this lecture. Okay, this data is big. So you can download all this open street map data for the planet uh, in XML format, which is a lot like HTML. 
Uh, so it looks like uh, tags and attributes. Um, it's more than a terabyte in size. So it's very large, very hard to work with. Uh, and there's a file you can download called planet.osm, which is all their data together. Um, so that's a bit too much to work with easily. So what we've done is we've extracted and downloaded several cities. You can basically take pieces of this data and we've taken city sized pieces. Um, so here's a, a piece of that data uh, in a human readable form. So it's OpenStreetMap and it's XML format. And this is the file for Toronto. Uh, and just to see what it looks like, it's not very magical. There are things like nodes, which each have these big IDs and latitude and longitude points. And there's, there's lots of this, okay? So this particular node represents uh, a traffic sign on a certain street. Okay, so the positive of this OpenStreetMap data is it's, uh, it's powerful. There's a lot of data, there aren't many restrictions. Um, this XML format is human readable. You can actually open up the files and you can look at them. Uh, and these files actually are in the public directory uh, for EC297. So you can actually go open them up and look at them if you want. The negative is that this data is low level. It can be hard to interpret. Um, so those nodes, ways, and relations, those are kind of very low level concepts, how those turn into streets and, uh, and uh, uh, parks and so on. And it's a, there's a lot of interpretation that's necessary. The data can be somewhat inconsistent. Uh, there aren't that many rules on the names that you can put in, for example. These are entered by volunteers, so there can be uh, different data conventions in different parts of the uh, world. Uh, and it's big. So the planet is one terabyte. Even just one city, Toronto, is, is a gigabyte. Uh, and it takes a while to load that. Because that's large, and the program actually has to parse the XML, like go through and figure out what does every character mean in this XML, and interpret it, it takes about 45 seconds to load this data in for Toronto. So um, we've applied a, a pretty standard technique to basically reduce the amount of data to only what we need uh, and to parse it in advance so that you can load it into your program quickly. So we wrote a program called OSM to bin, so OSM to binary. And uh, so teaching team wrote this. It reads in this raw OSM data. So big data, human readable form. It applies a bunch of consistency checks. It organizes the data and then it, and it kind of throws away the parts we don't care about. And it writes out only the important data, the things that we care about in an exact binary form. Okay, so it's no longer human readable. It's only machine readable. And the exact binary form that's written out is essentially exactly matches the memory layout of two classes, one called Streets Database API and one called OSM Database API that we wrote. This makes the data smaller. So the Toronto file drops from a gigabyte to 93 megabytes and it allows us to load it in much faster. So it can be loaded in around a second or if you bring in both of these APIs, it'll be a few seconds, but it's still a lot better than 45 seconds. Um, this data can't be read by a human, just big binary files. And it's been written out to exactly match how these classes will be laid out in memory. So the only thing you can do with this data is load it back in to reconstruct these classes in memory. This is a standard technique that you'll see in programming called class serialization. You write out the image of a class to disk so you can bring it back in fast. Um, and we do that with a library called boost serialization. So there are libraries to help you do this. You wouldn't write, want to write all this code by hand because it's really tedious and error prone but there are some libraries and a good one is in Boost to help make it easier. Okay, um, the data, you can still go read the XML data if you want to, that we started from. So this is a good practice, have a human readable form, but the program when you're running it doesn't use that human readable form. Offline, we've taken that human readable form and processed it to turn it into binary images to load our classes much more quickly and much more efficiently. Uh, so, so there's a question, what does it mean by initialize the same classes? So this binary file that we write out is basically a whole pile of ones and zeros that exactly matches the data that we need in our classes. So our classes have floating point numbers, integers, vectors, all sorts of stuff in them. 
what's written to disk is basically the bits that they're going to go into that. So um, when we want to reload these classes into memory, we can do it much faster by saying we have what's called a serialized version of this, a disk version of these classes, bring the data in from them. Okay. Uh, but the data is not, if we change the class, we have to go change that image on disk because the image on disk wouldn't work anymore. Okay. This is all kind of background for you. So, you know, if you're kind of thinking, okay, what do I need to know from this? Not much. Okay. You can go, oh, there's a whole bunch of data. The teaching team wrote some program that basically made some binary files. Uh, the binary files have the same data in them as those human readable ones, but they're going to be faster and they're going to give us some API calls to load them up. That's all you need to get from this, but it's often interesting to know what's going on behind the scenes. This is what's going on behind the scenes. Okay, so Milestone 1 is really all about application programming interfaces or API layers. So this Toronto.osm file is that big XML file, one gigabyte, um, human readable, but takes some time to parse. A program would have to go through and interpret all the characters in it and figure out what does all this mean. So as I said, we wrote this program called OSM to bin, which offline, we've already run it, and it's taken this human readable file and it's created actually two different uh, binary files that can load two different classes. So one of them is the less detailed one. It's called torontocanada.streets.bin. And one is the more detailed one that has basically all the OSM data. So this one kind of just has streets and intersections and outlines of parks, things we think are pretty interesting. This one has additional information that you might want to use uh, in later milestones, but you don't have to use it much if you don't want to. This is the one that you're going to use a lot. OK, so we. We create those two files offline, and the way that you talk to these binary databases is through a library, and a library is basically just a collection of object files. It's kind of like part of an executable. So we've compiled a whole bunch of C++ files to make a library called libstreet database. This is all written for you. Um, the two header files that are the most important to understand, this is the most important one, it's called streets database api.h. That defines the functions that can talk to this kind of more uh, higher level, easier to interpret uh, list of streets and intersections and so on. Okay, so you're going to use this a lot. And there's another header file called osm database api.h which is a lower level API, it gets you at those ways and nodes and relations, so things that are kind of more basic than streets and intersections. In Milestone 1, to get you used to using this, in case you want to use it later in your, your project, there's one function that requires you to talk to this. The other you know, 13 or so functions all require you to talk to this one. So this is the more important API to understand. This one you, can, you need to understand a little bit about it to write that one function. Okay, so that, that's all given to you. Um, what you have to write is you're writing another library called libstreetmap. So again, a library is like part of an executable program, a whole bunch of object files put together. And bigger programs are usually not made in one, just one executable. They're usually grouped in these things called libraries. It makes it easier to test them. I'm going to show you that, why that is in a couple of lectures, but for now, just trust me. There's a good reason why we organized it this way. So we've given you a header file called m1.h, and you can't change it. That is your specification of what you have to do for Milestone 1. You ha we've given you the header file that says what are the functions you're supposed to write. Now you have to write them. Okay. So you are going to write some code in libstreetmap slash source because we'll compile that into this libstreetmap library uh, so it's important you put your code there you can make as many cpp files as you want um, so we give you a skeleton one to get you going called m1.cpp with just a little bit of code in it but you don't you don't have to name your cpp files m1 you don't have to have just one so you can make other cpp files call them anything you want as long as you put them here okay we'll compile them all together and uh, make this libstreetmap. 
in order for your libstreetmap to work, it's gonna to have to call these lower level APIs. So we're gonna basically ask questions of your libstreetmap library. And in order to answer those questions, you're gonna to have to in turn make calls into one of these two APIs. Usually you'll be calling this one, streets database API. As I said, there'll be one function where you have to call this OSM database API. Does that make sense? So if any questions on this so far, just jump in and let me know. Um, and uh, someone's asking why not call routines functions? Uh, subroutines and functions are essentially the same thing. So the names are used pretty interchangeably nowadays. Okay, so that's kind of how a quick overview of, oh, API stands for Application Programming Interface. It basically is just, uh, usually an API is defined by one or more header files. It's just a bunch of functions or subroutines that you can call. So that defines an interface or an application programming interface. M1.h you cannot change, okay? M1.h is your, I see a question, can you change, can M1.h have a different uh, name? Everything in green here we've written for you and we made them all read only so that you can't change them. Um, that's on purpose. If you go change this header file, our tests, which directly call your library, will not work anymore. So you would be causing yourself a big problem. You'll just fail all the tests. So to stop you from doing that, it's read-only. Um, these header files are saying how to call an API that we, we wrote, a whole bunch of subroutines we wrote. If you go and change these header files, you're going to break all that code, which is also going to make your program not work. So these are also read-only. So everything in green is written for you and is read-only so that you don't cause yourself any problems. Everything in red, you are going to write, and you can do anything you want. Okay. Uh, and the, there's a question, doesn't the implementation need to be called m1.cpp? It doesn't have to be called m1.cpp. You can call it that if you want. Um, you don't have to make one file. You could make 10. m1.h defines quite a few different functions. So a reasonable organization is you could say, well, I'll put all of them together in m1.cpp. But you could also decide, mm, that seems like too much code in one one .cpp file and I'd like to split things across my teammates in multiple files so I'm going to make more than one file and that's fine too okay okay so how do we organize this uh, map data uh, let me give you a look forward of what are we going to do with all this data so in milestone one you're going to use this uh, the API we provided you with this streets I should get rid of the H this uh, lib street database API to implement a bunch of functions. So for example, one of those functions is, I'm showing here, find the street names of intersection. So given the ID of an intersection, tell me, return a vector of strings where each of those entries in the vector is the name of some street. Okay, so I've got an intersection, I've got various streets coming into it. I wanna get a vector with the names of all the streets coming into it, right? So maybe this one's young, and maybe this one was bluer. So not a very good uh, visualization of Young and Bloor. Those would be two of the strings in this vector. Uh, and in this particular function, we're saying the speed requirement is high. So we also want this to be fast. And I talked in the tutorial this week about exactly what does that mean. Um, so what you can do in Milestone 1 is you just got to build about 14 functions that we've defined in this header file um, that provide useful utilities that you're going to use later in the project uh, and also hopefully a good learning experience where you have to do some different programming techniques to make different uh, functions fast. In milestone two is graphics. You're going to use the uh, API that we provided, this one, plus the API that you're writing, so these utility functions, and you're going to build on those to be able to visualize the map. So you're not going to throw this code away. You're going to use a bunch of these functions again in the future. In milestone three, you're going to find paths through the map between two intersections. And that's again going to require that you can talk to this API and you're going to reuse a bunch of your functions. And in milestone four, you're going to go further in optimization and optimize a courier company delivery route, um, where you're actually not just trying to go between two intersections, but through n intersections in some order. Um, so I guess my point here is you're going to build on top of this. And this, the kind of learning goals of this milestone are learn how to talk to our APIs, 
Um, learn how to build your own API, learn how to make it fast, and you'll build on that for the future ones. Okay, so let's talk about how we're going to represent a uh, street map. So this is a picture of the campus near uh, of U of T. Um, and we're going to represent this as, as a graph. Okay, so a graph represents connectivity between different items. So who's heard of a graph? Did you study graphs at all in 244? Okay, so, so 244 did mention the graphs. Okay, that's that's good. So it sounds like it was pretty fast as well, but and that's fine. You, you don't need to know a lot about graphs. We're gonna talk about them in this course. Um, if you take data structures and algorithms in, in third year, you're gonna learn a lot more about them as well. Graphs are essentially how a lot of algorithms are, are encoded. Okay, but a graph is a data structure that represents the connectivity between items. It consists of two parts. It has vertices or nodes. Those are synonyms, they mean the same thing. And usually the set of vertices is denoted by V. And then it has edges between connected vertices. And those are denoted as the set E. So a graph is these two things together. Some vertices and some edges between them. Uh, so hopefully that kind of makes sense at a, at a high level. You've already used special cases of graphs. So in 244, you wrote linked lists. And a linked list, basically the you have nodes. Those are the nodes that you put in the linked list. That's where your data is. Uh, so if I linked list with you know four things in it, I'd have four nodes. And the edges are basically your next pointer. So you have an edge from every node to the one that comes after it. And if it's a doubly linked list, you have an edge which is your previous pointer. So you also have, you also know who's before you in the list. So, you know, that's, that's my linked list with four nodes. If I put a fifth node in, I put it over here, and I again hook up a couple of edges. So a next pointer and a, a previous pointer. Um, yeah, so that's one example of a graph. A binary search tree is also a graph. So in a binary search tree, you've got a node. It can have a left child and it can have a right child. And each of them can have a left child and a right child. And you know, sometimes you might only have one child and sometimes you might not have any children at all. Okay, so you even used the term node when you were talking about binary search trees, probably in, in EC244. So every node has a, a key and usually a value that comes along with it. And those are the vertices of your graph. And then your edges are basically your left child and your right child pointer. So what I've drawn here is, is a particular binary search tree. Both of these are examples of graphs. Does that make sense? So this is your chance to pipe up if you're going, nope, it's not making sense to me. Okay, so I'm gonna take that as, as you're with me so far. Okay, so you've already used graphs, you just didn't call them graphs. Um, but in, those are special cases of graphs. They're important special cases. Um, a general graph has fewer limitations. So in general, a graph again has nodes. So let's draw a few nodes here. Um, and the nodes are basically just things, right? So, and in general, you can have any number of edges at a node. So this node could connect to this, and this, and this. So now I've got a node with three edges. Okay, so that wouldn't be a linked list, and it wouldn't be a binary search tree. Um, and I also can have edges so that it doesn't form a tree structure, it doesn't form a, a linked list structure, so the edges can be anything. You can even have edges from one node back to itself. So what I just drew here is a perfectly valid graph, okay? Um, Okay, so if you want to know more about graphs, which are, as I said, a really important data structure and a really important way to define algorithms and work with algorithms, this is kind of the most classic algorithm textbook. If you take EC345 next year, you'll use this textbook. Chapter 22 of it uh, defines what a graph is, talks about different ways to store them, and then a whole bunch of the chapters after that are basically algorithms that you can do with graphs. 
so you don't have to read that in this course, but if you're going, oh, I'm, I'm intrigued, I want to know more about algorithms, you can go start reading in this and it, you, you'll use the information in your career or even in third year. Okay, so I told you about graphs because they're a good way to represent a street map. So we've got this graph, it's got vertices and it's got edges. So whenever we apply a graph to a problem, the first thing we need to think of is, is what are the vertices, what are the edges? So it's in the chat, what do you think for a street map, the vertices should be, what do you think the edges should be? Okay, streets, okay, intersections or vertices. So yeah, so you see a lot of people saying intersections or vertices and edges should be streets. Uh, and yeah, that's quite logical, okay? So, uh, so the vertices, are going to be intersections that they they make more sense to do that way um, a vertex is like a point in space and the streets kind of connect intersections so this is a pretty natural mapping so we're going to vertices are intersections okay and the edges are going to not quite be streets they're going to be what we call street segments so a street segment is like a city block it's a piece of a street it's basically the amount of street that goes between two intersections. So you can think of, let's take Bloor Street. So Bloor Street is really long, goes through a lot of intersections. That wouldn't make sense to represent that whole thing as one edge. Instead, we represent Bloor Street as a whole bunch of edges. The, uh, there's an edge between you know, Bloor and Young and Bloor and whatever the next street is, Church. And then there's another street from Bloor and Church, or street segment from Bloor and Church to whatever the next street is, say Bloor and Jarvis, and so on. Okay, so uh, that's what I've drawn here. It's just the intersections, so say this point, that's turned into a node, and this would be an edge from uh, Bay Street and Grosvenor to whatever this unnamed street and Grosvenor is. And then there'll be another street segment from there to there and so on. Another street segment from there to there. So the edges are not as long as a street. They're like a city block. Okay, that's what I'm showing here. So we have a whole bunch of intersections and we have a whole bunch of street segments connecting them. Okay, I see some good questions. So I think those questions are gonna be answered in some people are asking good questions like what about one way? What about if uh, the street segment's not curved? Those are good questions. Um, on a graph, it's typical to encode extra data on the vertices and extra data on the edges to because every problem usually needs some more information and we've done that too. So I'm gonna show that to you in the next few slides. Okay, before we get there, let's talk about how do we identify every vertex? Okay, so here's a, a piece of my city map. I've got vertices that represent inter intersections. I've got edges that represent street segments. How should I identify a vertex? And there are a bunch of different ways I could do this, but I want this to be fast. So what do you think good ways to identify a vertex are? I need something to identify where am I in the graph. Okay, so I'm hearing 64-bit int, pointer, give them a number, int, uh, ID, yeah, so lots of variations on ID, name, so yeah, I could use string names, uh, etc. So what we could use strings, that would be reasonable and it actually might be pretty friendly to the programmer looking at them because you could actually look at the string all the time and the string would probably be easy for you to interpret, like it says young and blur. We didn't do that. We didn't use strings. We instead used what a lot of other people I uh, suggested, which is integer IDs. The reason is that integers are smaller and faster to work with than strings. So while they have, don't have as much meaning to a person, you know, intersection 2300 doesn't have any real meaning to me, whereas intersection Young and Bloor has more meaning, um, they are faster for our program to work with. So we're gonna use integer IDs. And we're gonna, we've processed this OSM, OSM data. I already told you we do a lot of legality checking. We build some classes, classes, we write them out to disk and then you can load them back in. So we do a lot of processing of this OSM data to try to make things efficient. So the integer IDs we use are also somewhat special. So for intersections, our integer IDs start at zero and they go to get num intersections for whatever city you're in minus one. 
Okay, so for Toronto, that's about 166,000. So we use integers, and we don't just use any integer, because there are a lot of 32 or 64-bit integers. We use the integers from zero to the number of intersections in the city, minus one, okay? Um, the reason we do that, you'll see this in your tutorial, is this is a really nice thing for putting things in arrays or vectors, okay? If we didn't do this, it would be harder to use arrays and vectors, and arrays and vectors are, if you can use them, with nice IDs like this that start at zero and uh, don't, have, don't have gaps in them and go up to some number that's not too big, they're the fastest data structure you can get. So that's why we've used IDs of this form. And this is a, a standard technique, actually. When you're creating data structures, if you can make IDs like this, um, experienced programmers know this is like a good way to get things into arrays and vectors. And we recommend that you don't use arrays, use vectors because they're a better uh, array. Okay, so on this uh, little graph that I've drawn, all of our intersections will be identified by integers, and they're not really huge integers. So in this case, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Uh, we also have a string name. So intersections do have a name as well, but we don't use it as their main ID. So the, the code that you write is going to use that, that name if it wants some user output or some debugging messages, so it's there. But you don't use it for you know, checking what node am I at in the middle of some key loop, because that's going to slow you down. All right, so the ID is really the main way that you identify this. The name is there in case you have, need some user output. Does that make sense to everybody? If we'd done this the other way around, we'd made the name the main way you, you checked where am I, just the whole program would be slower, and we wouldn't have as many options of ways to store data for an intersection. Okay. Um, yeah, I see some questions, but I'll probably stay on the line after if I haven't answered your question. So, so this kind of shows what I've, what I've talked about so far. Um, let's see. Uh, the other thing that we have, that we, the other nice thing we can do with these integer IDs is we guarantee every single intersection has a unique ID. You'll never see the same number for two different intersections, whereas names, that might be harder to guarantee. Um, so this is what we wind up with now. These integer IDs are a main identifier, but there is a string if you want to use it um, for user output and so on. Uh, let's see. And there's a question, are the IDs completely random? Yeah, you, the IDs go from zero to some maximum number. So they're, they're what's called dense, uh, but there's no relation otherwise. You can't say, um, I know that ID 53 must be north-south, like or ID 53 must be uh, a certain intersection in the north side of this city. Don't make any assumptions like that at all. You have to just process the data. Okay, next thing we need to do is we now need to identify our, eight, our edges. So we have our intersections identified. We need to identify these street segments. We use the same idea. So we have an integer ID, which again is unique. So every single edge, every street segment gets its own ID. Um, again, it's gonna be small and fast. And we use a dense ID space. So they go from zero to, there's an API call you, you can make, get num street segments. So it'll go from zero to that number minus one for some city. For Toronto, there are about 215,000 of these uh, street segments. So every one of them gets their own ID. And these ones we don't give a name, okay? So street segments are not named. Okay, so I'm showing you, I just put all of these integer IDs in blue on the street segments. So you see there's a street segment zero and a street segment one and two and so on. One thing to be careful of is notice that there is an intersection number zero and there's also a street segment number zero. So the IDs for intersections and street segments overlap. You have to remember which is which in your code. You can't tell just by looking at this number, what does this correspond to? It's important you name your variables well and keep track of them in your code. Okay, so they're both integers. To make this a little more clear, in the API you're talking to, the Streets Database API that we wrote for you, 
we use type defs to make this more clear. Uh, how many of you know what a type def is? So if you know what a type def is, okay, so he's at least one person, so sort of, some, yeah. It seems like most people do. Type def is it's just like an alias, basically. So type def says uh, this name, street segment index, is actually a synonym for integer. And this name, intersection index, is actually also an, uh, a synonym for integer. So from the compiler's point of view, it doesn't care. It just goes, whenever I see either one of these names, I see integer, and I paste that into your code. From the programmer's point of view, it can make your code or, or API more clear um, by documenting what kind of variable we expect. Okay, so for example, we have a function called get intersection name, and it wants to know the ID of the intersection you're talking about. And the type of that is intersection index, which is really just an int. Okay, so we could just cross that out and type int. That's actually what the compiler is going to do. But this is a bit more of a hint to you that intersection index tells you I should be passing in an intersection ID. Um, it, but again, it will accept it. If I didn't pass in an intersection ID, if I just passed in some other random integer value, maybe one that corresponded to a street segment, the API is going to accept it. The compiler can't catch it. So you have to be careful that you're naming your variables well and remembering this represents an intersection or this represents a street segment. So we don't want to see things like this in your code. You don't want to write this code because it's going to be error prone. It's going to be hard for your teammates to figure out. So don't write int my index. I, mean, I don't know what this is. Maybe it's an intersection. Maybe it's a street segment. We've got multiple kinds of indices. So this isn't a good name. A much better name would be this bottom one, my intersect index, because it's obvious that that is an intersection. Um, so, and your TA is going to be a lot happier with the bottom name. So if you're not doing it for your teammates, do it for your TA because your TA will give you better style marks with the bottom ones. Uh, there's a question, can the same number define a street segment and an intersection? Yes. So for example, intersection zero is going to exist in every single street map we give you and street segment zero will also exist. And they refer to two diff completely different things. So you got to keep track of what are you asking. Depending on which API you call, they will expect one type of ID or the other. Okay. Uh, there's a question, would type defs take up more space? Type defs don't matter, okay? The compiler basically sees this as an alias def definition. And from the compiler's point of view, it just says, whenever I see, uh, for example, intersection index, and you said that's an integer, it basically crosses that out and put it, puts int. That happens in an early stage of compilation. So the compiler does not care at all. It's as if you wrote int from an efficiency point of view. Okay, so what kind of... Uh, graph should we use? There are two kinds. So let me ask people if they know this. Do you know what an undirected graph and a directed graph are? So what's the difference? There are two kinds of graphs, directed and undirected. Okay, yeah, so I see people saying arrow and no arrow. That's right. So that's an undirected graph on the left. It just says this node and this node are connected. There's no sense of direction. Um, so it's fundamentally bidirectional. This is a directed graph. So this says from this node, I can go to this node, but I, I, the backward one doesn't exist. There's no edge going this way. So it means from this node, I cannot go to that node. Okay, so that's a directed graph versus an undirected. Uh, what kind of graph do you think we're gonna use to represent a, a street map? Okay, so see a bunch of people saying directed. Uh, yeah, so directed makes sense because there are one-way streets. If we didn't have directed graphs, we couldn't... If we actually had a city that was all two-way streets, then this would be fine. But one-way streets exist, so we want to use this instead. So don't use that. Uh, what are we going to do if we... What if we have a two-way street? So you can go both ways down Blur Street, for example. What do we do? Yeah, so for a two-way street, we can just have two arrows. So that's totally fine. Okay, and so in Streets Database API, um, we essentially encode it in a graph where we tell you, here's, there's an intersection, an intersection, there's a street segment in between them, and then you can also ask, is that street segment one way or not? So we encode it in a slightly different way. It is a directed graph, but we basically tell you 
this is the edge between these two uh, intersections and then we tell you does that edge have an arrow on just one end or does that edge have an arrow on both ends this kind of represents two edges okay so that's the way the uh, streets database api that you're talking to works uh, it's done that way because it's basically a bit more memory efficient there's a bunch of extra information on edges so instead of doubling making two edges when we want to have a two-way street we basically always make one street segment and then we set some uh, additional attributes telling you whether or not it's one way and if it's one way which way is it okay um and you're going to the way you find this graph is you ask our streets database api questions so you can ask questions like i'm at a certain intersection say this one and you can basically say tell me how many street segments uh, are connected to me so for this particular intersection it would return three uh, you can also ask okay you told me there are three intersections or three street segments you can ask well tell me what they are okay so tell me their ids and that's what this second function is used for so we can now find which we know there are three street segments which ones are they and for each of these street segments, so let's take one of them, this street segment has a bunch of information on it, more than just I'm connected to this one intersection. So we can go ask questions about, tell me about the street segment. This is a piece of Bloor Street between two intersections. Tell me about it. Um, some of the things that we can ask it are we can ask, what's, what's the intersection on one end? Let's take a one-way street segment. So we can ask, what's your from intersection, which would be this one. So let's say we're talking about this street segment. We could ask, what is your two intersection, which would be this one. We can ask whether you're one way. In this case, it would say true. Okay, I am one way. Um, and you can ask some other questions as well. Uh, okay, so that, that's basically what I've shown you so far is connectivity. You can get the intersections, you can get the street segments, you can ask whether or not the street segments are one way and which way they're going if they're one way. That basically gives you the connect connectivity of the street map, but that's not everything we want. Um, we can also get uh, the latitude and longitude of our intersections, so where are they in space. And um, for our street segments, we can get their speed limit and we can get curve points. So someone asked earlier, what about city blocks that aren't straight? You can ask for something called curve points to get the shape of the street. And the last thing you can get is you can get the street index. So a street segment knows what street it came from, whether it came from Bloor Street or Young Street. And we use the same trick uh, as we use for intersections and street segments. Every street gets an ID as well. And that's done for speed and efficiency. Okay, so here's street segment curve points. Um, so you can ask a street segment, how many curve points do you have? This is a street segment with zero curve points. So it's just in space going to go straight from one intersection to another. And you can ask it what two intersections is it connected to. Uh, this is a street segment with two curve points. So it's going to start at its from intersection. It's going to end at its two intersection. And in between, it'll have two curve points. And you can ask, where are they? And they'll be connected in, in the, you know, between curve point zero to curve point one to the final intersection. And you can use that when you're uh, computing things about how long is the street segment, and you're going to use it in milestone two and drawing it so you draw the right shape. Uh, okay, so uh, so far we've talked about intersections and street segments. Uh, there also are streets. So here's Young Street. Young Street is a group of street segments. So every street also has its own unique in index. It goes from zero to the number of streets minus one. Uh, so about 15,000 streets in Toronto. It has a name, so you can ask what's its name. Its name might not be unique. There are a lot of main streets in most cities. Uh, and, and you can ask what street segments are part of you, okay? So you can, or actually you can ask a street segment, what street did you come from? Which is essentially enough for you to figure out what the streets are. 
There also are points of interest. So points of interest are things like Tim Hortons. Okay, they're just a point in space. So they also have another unique index and they can tell you their location and they can tell you their name and their name often is not unique. For example, a lot of points of interest will have different locations, but they'll have the same name of Tim Hortons. And then the last thing uh, I want to tell you about were features. So features are basically things that are nice to draw. Okay, so there are lakes, there are buildings, parks, streams. Uh, they don't define streets and intersections. They're not important for driving on, but they are important for visualizing a map. A feature in this API that we're giving you is basically a, a list of latitude and longitude points. And either if the first location and the last location are the same, then it defines a closed polygon, which would be something like you know Hyde Park here, or it could be the outline of Castle Lonely here. And if it's not uh, a closed polygon, the first location and the last location are different, then it defines a what's called a polyline, so just a line. So a stream might be like that. And there's one, one uh, API function in Milestone 1 that asks you to compute the area of features. And then the last thing that you can get um, is, remember I told you there's also this OSM ID. This is a different ID. It's the one OpenStreetMap uses. It's really big, 64 bits. It's unique for, for example, for this particular feature. It would be unique in the whole world. Uh, it would identify Hyde Park across all cities in the whole world. You can, you can get that OSM ID um, for the various uh, items that I just talked about intersections and street segments and so on and you don't have to do this in milestone one but in milestone two if you want to you can use this osm id to look up some additional information some of the low level data that we didn't translate into this more structured uh, api and header file okay so uh, i guess i'm a couple minutes over but i'm just going to see if i can get through this to get you ready for your lab uh, if you got to go go it'll be recorded so in Milestone 1, M1.h is the specification of what you have to do. They're the list of functions you have to implement, and there are comments saying what you should do. And this is good practice. The documentation is in the code. Uh, and in a header file, your comments just say how to use something, not how it's built. If you want to say how it's built, that goes in the CPV file. So M1.h is all about what these functions should do. There are also detailed unit tests. And you don't know what unit tests are yet, but we'll talk about them in a future lecture. Uh, in EC297 exercise. So you're gonna run EC297 exercise over and over again. Uh, and this enables something called test-driven development. That's the detailed specification of what these functions should do. You have to pass the tests. So most of them test that you get the right answer. Some of them also test speed. So if they're too slow, you'll fail. And one of them runs Valgrind to check that you haven't done anything bad to memory. You should Make sure you still run read m1.h because it defines a few corner cases which might not be tested by two EC297 exercise. If we describe a corner case in the header file, we are going to test it in the private tests. Uh, so if we say there's a corner case you should handle, you should make sure you handle it whether or not it comes up in the public tests. Okay, uh, and that's all I had to say today. I'll stay on the line in case uh, there are any questions.